their revenues are about $300 million. 85% of their revenues come from their relationship with Remus, which is the manufacturer. All right? Remus is a $3.25 billion company, and QAR is one of its many distributors. Now, QAR is their favorite distributor in many ways. They're the best distributor in their region. In fact, they like them enough to give them preferential treatment in revenue share. So if you look at the other distributors that Remus has, uh, QAR is treated a little bit better. The problem is QAR is really good at what it does, and unlike the other distributors, they have very high aspirations. They want to break out of this role of just being a distributor. They want to branch out into other regions and other industries, and that is making Remus very nervous. Because if there's somebody that could grow up to be a threat to Remus, especially in these other industries that are related, it could be QAR. So what Remus decides to do is put a stop to it. And Remus goes to QAR and says, listen, uh, we've decided to enhance the cooperativeness of our, of our business model and of all our distributors, that we're going to institute some policies in the coming months and years. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to institute a policy that says uh, no distributor can do any business outside of its current region. And if you want to be involved in any other industries, uh, you're going to be involved as an affiliate of Remus. So if you have some ideas, you bring them to us, and we'll work on them together. In other words, stay in your two or three states, and don't open up to any other industries that might hurt us in the future. Now, the, the threat there, of course, is if you don't do that, we can always get rid of you and get a different distributor for that region. And here's the impact of what happens if that takes place. If Remus takes away QRR's business, QAR's loss of revenue will be about 80%. Even though 85% comes from their relationship with Remus, they'll be able to pick up some with other manufacturers. So they're going to lose 80% of their business. Remus's loss of revenue by losing this preferred distributor will be about 3%, a drop in the bucket. So QAR is completely in a bad situation. Because if they tried, and they've tried, they've been starting up with some initiatives, they've been trying to go into other regions and in new industries, and every time they start doing that, they get a call from Remus that says, hey, I don't think you want to be doing that. All right, and so they, they, they've tended to back off. So if you think about where they are now, their current deal gives them preferred revenue share. They have no constraints on their strategy and no forced affiliation, but the current momentum is pushing them into a space where they might lose their preferential revenue uh, deal, they might lose all flexibility, and they might be forced to affiliate. They might be pushed so hard that they lose $240 million worth of their business, 80% of the $300 million. That's their fear. And their hope is that, well, maybe we can accept the affiliation, and maybe we can accept the, the lack of flexibility, but can you help us at least keep our, most of our preferred revenue share? Because that's still a big piece of what we're making money from. So I said, sure, that's an important thing to think about. But let's do a little bit more analysis before we, we jump ahead and start begging for money. Let's do some analysis of what really happens if there's no deal. Now, there's lots of complications in this story. Just, Tons of complications, so I'm really watering it down and, 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 and for, the, for the current purposes. So if you look at QAR, we've already established that they lose 80% of their revenue, which is $240 million, but they also gain a few things. If they break ties with Remus, they have some future business opportunities that they currently don't have, and they get to retain their sovereignty. And this is a family-owned business, so they actually like having the ability to, to have their own legacy. And if I ask them and I push them to value how much future business opportunities and sovereignty is worth to them, they, they put a value of about $50 million. So the first thing to keep in mind is you're not on the hook for $240 million. You're on the hook for $190 million, which better but not great. But let's see what happens. So your feared outcome is not really losing $240 million. Your feared outcome should now be that the worst case scenario is that we're going to lose $190 million. But let's continue the analysis and, and, and take a page out of the book of the campaign manager and see what the campaign manager may have asked us to do going forward. Let's look at Remus. If there's no deal, Remus loses 3% of $3.25 billion. That's still about $100 million. Furthermore, they also lose some political connections, because it turns out QAR is really well connected politically, and Remus has leveraged those connections on occasion. And losing the best distributor might also hurt their reputation a little bit, that they couldn't keep their house together. And so if we push people to think, well, what might that be worth? Well, that might be worth another $20 million. So if you think about what happens to Remus if there's no deal, they could also potentially lose $120 million. So what does that tell us? 
There's a worst case scenario that's much worse than the current deal, but at least theoretically, there's a best case scenario where you get a better deal than you currently have. And what QAR has been focusing on is how bad their situation is, and not at all on the value they bring to the other side. If you think about what we call the zone of possible agreement, all the things that are potential outcomes of this negotiation, being too focused on the left side is a strategic mistake. What you want to be thinking about is the entire spectrum. It is possible to move in the other direction, or at least leverage the ability to move in the right to get at least your current deal. And the question is, how do you change momentum? And that's the strategic perspective that we've started working with, with QAR. In other words, when they tell you not to do something in another industry or region, don't take it as a given. No more, yes, sir. No more apologizing. The status quo is not you've lost your freedom. The status quo is we've always had our freedom. Every company deserves this freedom. And the question is, can we re-anchor the negotiation and change expectations and push for this and really highlight the value that we bring to the other side? And the progress that we've made over the last four months is, is immense. We are no longer falling onto the left side, we're starting to move towards the right side, but all it really requires is an ability to shift focus. And so if you want to, to, to take some lessons from the Roosevelt and QAR situation, the first thing you want to think about, uh, especially in the Roosevelt example, is uh, you may have a weak alternative. You're, you may be very weak, but you don't want to reveal it to the other side. And, and I see this happen all the time. And, and people do this often um, by mistake. They reveal how weak they are. You'll have a a consultant or a small business that's starting out in an industry, and they'll, they'll finally land a good potential client. And the potential client will say, well, uh, I can meet uh, next week sometime. Uh, wh when can you meet? And the immediate response comes out, I can meet anytime you want. Or I'm free Monday through Friday. Uh, why don't you name the day? And, and the signal you're sending, of course, is that you have no other business. All right? Imagine a response that says, well, I can meet Tuesday afternoon or Friday morning. Imagine the signal that that sends, all right? And when they, if they come back and say, well, I can't meet Tuesday or Friday, then you can say, well, why don't you name a day and I'll see if I can make it happen, right? But, but implicitly, we often show our cards too easily, all right? That's something that sleazily the campaign manager did not do. Um, the second insight here is that having a weak alternative is not so bad if the other side is weak as well. And often, we don't see that. We're so obsessed with our situation that we forget to think about the value we bring to the other side. Keep in mind, if you don't bring any value to the other side, you don't really deserve much value in the negotiation. Right? If you're not making anybody's life better off, how can you possibly monetize anything? But you need to keep an eye on that. Being weak is bad. Feeling weak can be fatal. All right? And that's the difference between thinking about being on the hook for $3 million and being consumed by that weakness versus stepping back and saying, let's think about this analytically. What can we actually do here? The person who defines the scope of the negotiation often wins the negotiation. Think about this. 